may, may I just uh, uh, intervene here for a second? This is very interesting uh, point that you made because it's the same point as the British elections that we just saw the other day. We had 59.9% of show-ups on the vote, and according to according to Alexander Mercury's, at least, it has been the the the, the lowest level of show-ups since late 1800s. So oh, even before wow. world wars, so it, it, that this shows the absolute. This really shows the absolute uh, um, lack of belief, apathy, and lack of belief on the system. You know, this is uh, uh, we in Brazil. Uh, I always mention this in Brazil. On the last three or four elections, we have a result of uh, uh, of who we who won in the end was the non shows and yeah. and uh, no votes. You know, people can just go there and know the vote and whatever because it's easier than pay the the fine of uh, 50 cents uh, and not going so uh, and we had the, the results of 33 percent well, Lula won the last one with 33 or 32 percent against 27 28 uh, from Bolsonaro and almost 30 34 32 34 percent no show or canceled uh, And, and, and this shows that people do not believe in the system. And uh, one thing that uh, also that you mentioned that is extremely important, that is more or less the same thing that happened in, Britain, in Brittany, in Great Britain, was that um, the result was completely screwed up in the last minute. Mm -hmm. So you have a party that won in the case of uh, the one majority of votes in the case uh, the Rassemblement National, uh, and in Brittany the uh, and in in England the, the the Labour Party made the majority, but also in the last minute the 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 Tories made the jump that they were really bad. And you know Boris Johnson came, came out, uh, came back from vacation, and one day before, and and <laughs> made a big speech, and you know grabbed a couple, always with the fear, you know, oh, if you vote for the labor, the country is going to become commie, and or uh, in France, if you vote for the far right, we're going to become you know mustachists or whatever. And this is um, this is a completely unfunctional society. In, in my view, and, and I'm come from a country that is unfunctional, so I know a little bit of what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, uh, but there is a caveat there, which is the French people. And that's one thing that I wanted to ask about the temperature of the French people, because, you know, the British, they, you know, they, they grab a couple of tea or whatever. The French bur burn cars. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, so, we. <laughs> We've got to deal with the insurance companies. <laughs> no, Fr Fr the France are very mad. Let's not forget that. Uh, uh, France, uh, we had the yellow vests. That means for more, more than a year. Ordinary people, a lot of people were not at all in, uh, in the political movements, would go out every day across France, on the, on the, uh, on the roads, on the, on the motorways, In this, uh, it started as is actually a grassroots movement coming from the countryside, and these are the, these are again the ordinary people. They're not political. They they understand. They have they don't all have higher education, but they understand very well because they've got common sense. They understand that they know a thief when they see one. They know a liar when they they see one. They don't have to go to postgraduate schools or get masters or whatsoever. They understand that, and too much enough was enough because their purchasing power was falling was was lowering because they're feeling kicked out of this globalist world they're feeling kicked out of democracy they vote for candidates which never get elected even they get millions of votes they don't get elected they're not represented uh, on the media they their culture is being uh, uh, is being uh, atomized or destroyed by by foreign culture whether you like it or not i mean this is this is the this, so they're feeling kicked out and they went to the crossroads and they went in the streets and they during a whole year and there were a lot of burnt cars and there was a lot of of, of, of fighting against uh, against the police and against but this was quite interesting because this came out of france and i still keep on thinking myself that france has a particular ro role to be played So maybe this is something all French think. I don't know. Maybe it's this is natural that we think this or not. But th this came out of France, and this is something which scared 
the government and the elites because it was not controlled. There was no controlled opposition. There was no head that you can uh, menace or say, oh, be careful if you keep on doing that. We're going to show this video of you when you were when you were younger and that uh, you may be ashamed of. Or So they couldn't grasp this movement. And at the end, they finally understood and they put in uh, they put in mainstream uh, uh, the, I would say unions, which took over. They went into the cities. And then once the unions weren't there, a lot of these unions are yellow unions and and they worked hand in hand with uh, with uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the power and then the oligarchs. And so that was dead. But that happened over a year. So this was actually quite interesting because in those movements, and I, and I studied them closely, uh, there were people from the left. There were people from the right. There was this, I would say, God spirit of people saying listen we may not agree on everything but we love France we want our sovereignty and we all agree that we want to fight against poverty that we want to better the uh, I would say our purchasing power and that also we, we want a better culture and I think this is something which is interesting it was not just we want more money that we'd be used to in fascist. We, we want to live decently as French people and uh, and this is something which is interesting so there's still that mentality and a lot of people are dreaming that the yellow vests come back, but it was extenuating every day for many people, every weekend for for others. This was it was difficult, and they got I think Macron let a couple billion euros out of that, but uh, he he calmed everybody down. The fact again that in these elections, we'll see what Macron does with this government. That a lot of people in France feel that they're not being heard, that that they're not being taken seriously, that their personal situation is not getting better. They will continue to put pressure and then going back to the streets is obviously something which can which can happen quite quickly in France. That was going to be my comment. I literally have a note on that, that the French are known as a country of protest. If you compare it to the to the rest of Europe, it's just you just never see the same level of protest on on many topics. I mean, of course, they're now, you know, anti-war protests regarding Palestine, but not domestic issues. So that's very interesting. I think an argument could be made that people who are have not been educated in, in Ivy League schools or their equivalents probably have a better um, instinct regarding what's going on without having potentially that brainwash. I mean, in some cases it's education, in other cases it's brainwashing, and of course reincorporation into the social structure Then you no longer want to challenge because you have perks by participating in it. So I think you see that actually in many, many other countries where people who may be less formally educated but live, you know, and live in the periphery have, have better instincts. And be because they have similar instincts with people who may be technically on, you know, in another in sort of the opposing side of the political spectrum, like the way you're describing the sort of right wing united with the left wing on some issues. So that's very interesting. But I had a... Um, well, first of all, I'll say that we, we talked about the collapse of Western democracy, I think, here many times. Um, and it's exactly what you say. It's either um, systemically built in where candidates that may get a lot of votes just never even make it into any form of government, or you have a low turnout, whether it's apathy, whether it's anger, um, there, there's just that complete hopelessness in the system to begin with. And again, it applies to other countries in Europe and beyond. But also, I think uh, it also shows, you know, the, the, the ideal of democracy that you're changing governments every five years, every four years, right, depending on what the country is. It doesn't really change the system. It doesn't challenge the system. The system operates on its own It's once it's been set in place. And it sort of negates the argument of some of these other leaders in Russia and China, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that have been in power for much longer because changing changing people in the same chair without changing policies and kind of pursuing the same trajectory that many perceive as being detrimental to their respective countries changes nothing and it's no wonder that people are feeling apathetic about the state of modern democracy because they you know they seem to realize that their voice that is always promoted as your voice matters you know perform your civic duty this is the most important thing you'll ever do nothing ever happens and it happens in every election cycle and i think it's very very interesting. But I wanted to ask a very specific historic question. You might just provide a very quick clarification. It whether de, de Gaulle or Gaullists, you know, people who were aligned with them, was there more of an opposition to the precursor of the European Union or NATO? Or do you think those were pretty equal initially? 
both so post World War II, both equally. Yeah, both equally. De Gaulle definitely wa- didn't want the European Union because he thought it was really unfair that uh, all of a sudden the French had to forget what the Germans did after World War II. And the U.S. said, "Listen, the best way uh, to, to, to 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 get back on a peaceful path with the Germans is to forget about it, to c- c- create World War II." And the goal, he was a military. Uh, he 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 did not forgive the Germans, and he did not want this this European Union because of that. He understood that Europe had to find some way, some sort of path to peace, because the speciality of Europeans is to is is to be fighting between each other, and this is some sort of a, uh, I would say, in, in internal feuds become wars, and we keep killing each other, and that's been a story about Europe since the since the beginning. So he understood that he had a lot of pressure. There was a lot of pressure by the United States, uh, who was uh, saying, "You want Marshall? F- you want Marshall Plan money?" You've got to go forward with the European Union. You want me to to get to, to forget the debt you've got in France? You've got to go forward with the European Union. So at that time, the the construction of what was to become the European Union was something which was really pushed by the uh, by the United States and and also a lot of the French elite, who at that time believed because they, again they were already in the beginning of those think tanks and some of them received money uh, from the U.S. Embassy in uh, in France and uh, Eric Branca is a very known uh, uh, historian here in France and uh, he wrote about that and and so they thought again let's take the money and let's go let's go build this European Union what could be bad about this and uh, again a lot of them just did it for noble purposes they thought that the best way to stop these wars between European nations was to to find some sort of way of working together but the goal understood from the start that this would be some sort of supranational political entity and that all the nations would at one moment disappear and that people who were really behind pushing for this European Union wanted as European Union as a supranational state with no more nations with no more people and and he fought he fought dearly against that and that's why also he fought against NATO i mean he France stayed in NATO but he wanted to, he wanted to be out of the integrated command because he understood very well that in NATO France would just be uh, another army depending on the US army and he didn't want that you know de Gaulle did not celebrate uh, the the debarquement the arrival of uh, of the british and the american in normandy because he considered it as a second invasion so i mean this uh, this says a lot about the way de gaulle uh, i mean he was happy to work with of course uh, the americans who came to fight but he knew that behind these these americans who came really and who gave their uh, their blood to fight for uh, for for france and for europe the politicians behind that had another program and de gaulle knew also that uh, there would have never been the the, bar- the the arrival of the american paratroopers in normandy if there hadn't been stalingrad so uh, and and then barbarossa so uh, so no and uh, bagration sorry and so he knew that and he wanted france to be independent and unfortunately i think his Uh, his failure is that he did not find somebody after him who was able to keep up that fight. He said in the 60s two things. After uh, France gave its independence to Algeria, he said the biggest threat to France is American imperialism. So this is said 60 years ago. Mm-hmm. And he also chastised the uh, what he called the Americanization or this thought that uh, the French uh, elite, French establishment, French bourgeoisie uh, was so much under the influence of the Anglo-Saxons. And this was in the in the 60s. And it was, this was just like some sort of huge wave of America's so great, America's culture, America's money. And uh, at that time, of course, Europe was destroyed. Europe had been through the war and they were and we were receiving images of big fancy cars, huge ca- huge houses and people globally we thought shared the same values and those were more globally christian values at that time and so many people thought listen this is the easy way out let's follow what uncle sam says and and we'll be happy and the goal he knew that was not true but he did not have i would say maybe enough means he did not give enough time to, to uh, i would take to develop to develop a counter establishment a counter lead a school of thought that would resist this temptation of of, uh, of being totally submitted to the globalists and to the, and to the American hegemon- hegemony. It's interesting because if you didn't give us the dates for those quotations, they sound very contemporary. You know, this, this could be someone speaking now. And so I think by de Gaulle's standards, if you were to 
you know, rise from the dead and see what's happened since then in terms of that particular domain, he probably would be pretty horrified because based on your description, it sounds pretty consistent in terms of his pushing for sovereignty, regardless of whom he is opposing in terms of having their excessive influence. And it's also interesting that you mentioned the Marshall Plan. Do you think the Marshall Plan was sort of a way for the Americans to establish their institutions in Europe and incorporate the European elites and then having these elites go to their schools and basically establish the system where everything is intertwined and then it becomes more and more difficult to you know call for sovereignty but achieving it seems almost impossible when you have that level of uh, integration of you know el elites across the Atlantic um, the you know maybe the way even certain institutions were established after World War II how do you perceive the Marshall Plan in this in this domain in this uh, context you're totally right a French author called a historian professor called Annie Lacroix just wrote a book explaining this I mean, and many other authors uh, in France and outside of France that have, have uh, analyzed this. After the war, the European economies were destroyed. It was diff very difficult uh, to, to start the economies once again. And the US came and said, listen, we'll, we'll lend you money. We'll give you money. But it's nothing's free. So what the French had to do, for example, in the Marshall Plan is that they had to, uh, they had to buy goods coming out of the United States. So we started changing our view towards agriculture because we had small agricultural farms and we started importing huge American tractors and starting developing huge agricultural uh, uh, ex uh, extensive farms. And this changed the French landscape. This changed the mentalities. We were a very rural a country. We started becoming more and more uh, uh, living in the, in the cities. Uh, we had American uh, consulting firms. We had uh, accountancy firms explaining us how we had to build our accountancy to receive the money. We had to, we had these consultants and they, these are the consultants, they took people coming out of the French universities, out of French business, they brought them to the US. And of course, they only showed this, the sunny side of the US, how great American corporations were. And, and the US after the Second World War, it was a, it, they had, as I said, I think 40% of the, the world, half of the world's wealth and 6% of the population. So for many people coming out of the ruins of Europe, this was a fantasy. They said, listen, we want the same thing. We want we want stability. We want peace. We want two cars, a TV, a refrigerator. Uh, we, we want to wash our hands just by turning on faucets. So this was a dream for them, but that had a price. So France gradually had access to that and the other European countries. But at the same time, we had this very strong influence from the US, which went to the extent whereby the Blooms Burns uh, uh, agreement, we had to show US movies in our theaters. So this was, again, this was not free. Why would the U.S. want us to watch their movies? Because they had, there was a political agenda, because there's a program, because this is the beginning. And uh, I mean, we, go now, we don't have to go back to Bernays and propaganda or to Lippmann and the fan, or even what Chomsky called the fabrication of consent. But progressively, we started to become American. We started living like American. We started dreaming like Americans and wanting the same thing. We wanted a bit of that American dream as well and uh and and this is came through the marshall plan and the, the substantial help that the u.s brought which was not at all free it was to help us build uh, i would say uh to, to to put part of western europe and if the u.s had succeeded they would have put the socialists and communist europe and uh, under the same plan they proposed the marshall plan to the to communist countries as well there they understood very well that if we depending uh, depended on them for money for political stability then at the end you know we'd they, we'd be we'd be caught in the trap we'd be caught in the net and this was a long-term process and now we're we, we're over it we've we, we've we've been trapped the goal understand that but that marshall plan was some was i'd say the the very devious plan uh very uh, efficient plan for, for Washington and those who wanted to keep Western Europe under and under, under their thumb, that definitely this is something which uh, which worked for the U.S. and uh, and uh, curb the sovereignty of uh, of European states. Okay.
interesting because very recently we talked about the famous graph in France, 1945 to uh, the 90s, right, the early 2000s, that talked about the biggest contribution to victory in, in World War II in Europe, starting the initial stats were, you know, designating that victory mostly to the Soviet Union, but... Presumably because of Hollywood propaganda, I mean, the way you described it was very interesting to me, um, that statistic decreased and the United States had their greatest role, you know, 40, 50, 60 years later. So I think the, the power of propaganda was definitely being recognized back then. But the interesting thing about the Marshall Plan is when I personally looked at some of the statistics, it seemed that, yes, it did give that necessary push, but the majority of European recovery after World War II was done by Europeans themselves. So it was not this savior of, of Europe type of plan. It was just this little push. So in my opinion, the Americans got more out of that plan than the Europeans. Who yet, Yes, they did have the recovery, but it was mostly their, their own doing. So I think that's, I'm not sure how many people today recognize the fact that they themselves did it in Europe with a little bit of help, that, that necessary edge perhaps.